finishing your the little promotion. Great. And I believe we are. I believe we're live. So, hi everybody. Uh, this hi is, there. <laughs> I'm Marcia. Wherever you are, wherever you are. <laughs> I am Marcia. You may know me, but this is Joshua Hammer, and hopefully you know him as well by his his uh, books that he has written. And I'm just delighted to have you here today on the show. Thank you, Joshua. Well, I, I, yeah, I have a real uh, conservation-oriented show. It's always nice to see those. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. So you are the author of The Falcon Thief, which is our topic today. So I'll just give a little background. You are also, you've traveled the world as a foreign uh, journalist or correspondent with Newsweek, correct? And not anymore, but yeah, for a yeah. long, for many years. Oh, okay. Yeah. And you're a freelance writer currently since, in yeah, Berlin. Since 2006. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So, and you are also, and I love the title of your other book. Um, you're you're the author of the New York Times best-selling author of the Badass Librarians of Timbuktu. So, which I actually just ordered. I haven't read it yet, but I really. I really want to. It, it sounds amazing. I'm and, still alive four years later. Yeah. Still, still hanging in there. Yeah, yeah. You, you do In fact, lot. it's getting more reviews on Goodreads each day than The Falcon Thief, which is either a great reflection on my 2016 book or a very poor reflection on The Falcon Thief. Oh, um, yeah. I think The Falcon Thief is just picking up speed, though, I think. Thanks. Yeah. So oh, ho hopefully you'll get, get some new readers after this, um, this talk, for sure. So... Um, let me just make sure. And people, if you have any questions out there, we I, I'm sure, Joshua, you're open to taking questions from people if they would like to um, come on and, and tell their, you know, ask questions about the book. Or yeah. if you haven't read the book, maybe you can find out more. So, but anyways, but yeah, how are things going? You're in Berlin. How are oh, yeah. You? Yeah, are things okay? Things with good here. Things have been good, you know, all the way through, really. I mean, okay. compared to the rest of the... Certainly compared to the USA. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, there are only like a few hundred cases a day in the entire country now, which is a population of like 90 million. So it's pretty, oh. they've really got things under control. I think there's obviously this worry about the second wave and everything, but people are um, going to work. Schools are open to, uh, with the restricted uh, rules, uh, okay. restaurants, you know, it feels normal when you're out on the streets, practically normal. Oh, interesting. Okay. Not quite. Yeah. Practice. Yeah. Yeah, we're just starting to get opened up a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. You know, restaurants aren't quite open here in our area um, in California. Mm -hmm. So, and, um, but yeah. So I'm going to flash a cover of your book so everybody can okay. see that and make sure that that works. So here is the book that we're going to be talking about today. It's a wonderful book if you haven't read it yet. Um, I absolutely loved it. It's, it, it reads just like a true adventure. It is a true adventure, crime life. You know, I mean, it's almost like it should be made into this action movie of, um, yeah, yes. <laughs> maybe. Development. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Development. yeah. Not me, but. Yeah. yeah. So I that I think that's interesting. I just was going to share a quick story too. I, I, you know, I started reading your book, The Falcon Thief, like right when we came in shelter in place. And uh -huh. my whole shelter in place theme has been not not by choice or by accident. It's been about it's my shelter in place has been about falcons. So the day that I first opened your book, four four falcon eggs were actually laid at the bell tower at UC Berkeley that I've been watching on a video cam. And um, yeah. At, Wow. Right. It, Mar I guess March is when was Shelter in Place instituted? March sixteenth for us. So yeah, yeah. So and today oh, right. for full closure of the yeah. Falcon theme is I'm interviewing you, but also those those hatched um, Falcons are estimated to fledge today from, from UC today. Berkeley. Yeah, That's nice. isn't that cool? <laughs> So, yeah, so That's it's been, I've been watching them daily. I have my coffee and really? watch, watch the peregrines, but. It's a cool sight. I, all I have are pigeons. Yeah. <laughs> They're still fun. I have pigeons that nest on our bathroom ledge. Oh, nice. Third, third floor, actually, third floor apartment. Oh, okay. And, uh, 
Yeah, they're kind of cool too. <laughs> they are. I like I like birds in general. So that that brings me to um, my first question: Are you? Did you ever consider yourself growing up as like an animal lover or a bird lover? Um, not out of the or not not in particular. No, yeah. I mean, I mean, we had. Um, it's a very good question. Nobody's, in fact, on the book tours asked me that. Oh. I mean, we had pet domesticated animals all along when I was a kid, and you know, I don't, I don't think more than the, more than the average kid, in particular, and certainly not a bird watching person by any means. That came, uh, that came much later. Much, oh. much later. <laughs> that came when I was living in Africa, and I and I kind of got into fish eagles, going to see fish eagles up in the Rift Valley and those lakes in the Rift Valley, and I was. African fish eagles were a pretty amazing sight. So, they yeah, are. and then it didn't like become a full fledged activity, and it still isn't. I just happen to like birds. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah, I always wonder. I mean, just just the topic of what interests you about the story, and I want to get into that. Like, how how did you find out about the story? And I know you write about it, but I want you to I share. Do, but people may probably haven't read the book, so they might want to know that. Yeah. Like, you know, like it's, it's in the first on the first page yeah <laughs> yeah i mean it's, it's kind of it's interesting because you just kind of happen to come so can you share that story how you came yeah, I was about just, this I, you know, I was scrounging around in that phase the other writers many other authors talk about about looking for the next book idea mm -hmm. and it been through a few ideas it didn't go anywhere and then um I was just in London with my kids on a holiday and i picked up the times of london in a, in a cafe in hampstead and uh and read this article about this um, uh, falcon thief, Br British uh, uh, Irish national who had um, uh, fled from Brazil. Um, had been he had been convicted and sentenced to prison for um, absconding with live uh, alb albino falcon eggs. Is the way that was quite the truth, but that's the way they described the article. Rare albino falcon eggs from Patagonia that he'd been trying to smuggle out to Saudi Arabia to Dubai and had been stopped in Brazil, and that had had uh, escaped, put a, had been bailed out and escaped, and was a fugitive. And I don't know, just something about, it all just kind of hit me almost immediately, well, immediately, that there was a lot of weird elements here, and that, you know, I almost had a sense, sort of a serendipitous sense from the beginning that, uh, I'll bet there's, there's, there's a book here. Yeah. Yeah, just from the various <laughs> elements in the article. Oh, and he had also said that he had been, I had a career of um, of uh, uh, snatching rare bird eggs from uh, or protected bird eggs from cliff sides in places like northern Canada, where he would helicopter down and, and, and dangle from a rope and steal the oh eggs God. from nests from or from ledges, nest sites, ledges, areas, um, you know, 100, 200 feet up on cliffs. So you know, it was just too strange. The elements of the Middle East smuggling to the Middle East. This underground falcon market, um, tales of daring do, fugitive, escapist, escaping from, you know, Brazil, Brazilian prison, and a lot of elements, right? Yeah, yeah, it makes for a good story. Did you, you did you know anything about this world at all before? No, Nothing no about I mean, I had read Helen McDonald. I didn't even, I wasn't even really aware of falconry until I read Helen. I mean, I knew falconry, ancient sport. You know, yeah, yeah, sport of the kings, Middle Ages is about all. Uh, no idea who was still practicing it, how many people were into it. Then I read Helen McDonald's book, and uh, that kind of gave me an interesting introduction. I had not realized that T.H. White was a falconer, but oh, I, I didn't loved know that. I loved the Once and, and Future King, and uh, when I wish I read when I was in high school. So um, yeah, so that was kind of my exposure. Um, but it seemed like an intriguing world, uh, and it had this like underground, uh, corrupt, uh, dark side to it. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, worth worth exploring <laughs> yeah yeah so you started exploring this did you um was was andy mcwilliam mentioned in that article at all did you know about him no, at, at that point okay national wildlife crime unit was mentioned oh, okay which, um, and so that's how i started just by reaching out by i think by email to nwcu and they put me in touch with andy and he got back to me quickly uh we had a chat i said i was doing this i originally had had pitched as a magazine piece to outside oh, okay. in santa fe which i worked for uh, contributing editor for many years there and that was a natural one for them so they said yeah let's do it and uh and then andy uh quickly graciously agreed to meet me 
Um, and I, in, in Wales, where uh, Lendrum had been, uh, had his, um, so McWilliam had arrested him in 2010 um, yeah. after he'd been caught at the airport in Birmingham smuggling fal- peregrine eggs that he had still stolen from nests in the in the Rhondda Valley in Wales. Wow. So Andy agreed. In fact, I think Volander offered to meet me in Wales and go retrace uh, Lendrum's footsteps in these cliffs out there in the coal, mi- old coal mining country of Wales. So that's where we met originally. We met, I, I oh, okay. This and then, yeah, and then, yeah. Is that that picture you sent me? Um, should I flash that of yeah, William sure. and you're See, out? I'm See, I'm not seeing anything. Oh, there. okay. Yeah, but I don't know if it's showing. Um, I think I identified it uh, to you. Yeah, it's the Andy Mc... A couple of cops. Yep. At yep. the edge Stand- of the cliffs, right? Yeah, hillside. And I think Andy's the one with the binoculars around his neck on the right. He's, a big, he's yeah. a big guy. He's on the right. Yeah. Yeah. He's a big guy. Yeah. 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 So that's Andy McWilliam on and the right. And that's Ian. Um, Ian, I uh, forgot his last name. He's the Welsh counterpart of, Mc, of McWilliam who picked me up in Cardiff and we hung out. So they were both working together on the Lendrum case. And uh, yeah, or had been. This was, you know, had been. This was seven years earlier they've been on the Lendrum case. Um, and yeah. so, yeah, Andy was pretty generous and open about it and about his work, you know, about the case, turned over files to me. Um, and um, I pretty quickly got the idea, not so much for the magazine article, but for the book that I wanted to write, mm-hmm. that I would make him the kind of uh, counterpart, you know, heroic counterpart to the villain of the story, the rogue of the story. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So that's how Andy ended up becoming a pr- prominent character. I mean, he was a pretty, you know, he was a fairly ordinary guy yeah. from the streets of Liverpool, except he did have this really interesting bird fixate, you know, bird uh, obsession, really, like Landrum did. You know? And uh, but in a healthier, healthier way, I would think. Yeah, yeah. but he yeah. also knew about the bird and egg underground. You know, he was sort of the point man in the British in British law enforcement for okay. that weird those weird crimes yeah yeah so he yeah so even before lendrum before he was caught because i think he was introduced like that whole first part of your the first part of your story i think is kind of an introduction to how those two come together right in 2010 and um yeah and that's kind of our you know mcwilliams kind of middle career with that and lendrum's kind of late middle career kind of the same age pretty close to the same age yeah 61 and McWilliam was born in 57. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. And I, it, and you talk a little bit and I, you know, you can, McWilliam during that pre Lendrum time, he confiscated a bunch of eggs from egg collectors and in, in, in liver in, in, in Merseyside. Yeah. Yeah. yeah actually, and, you know, much all over the country. Yeah. Yeah. And that's. No, actually, that it was mostly Merseyside, yeah, but... Um, that's amazing yeah. world to, to hear about. Yeah, well, that's what gave him his sort of understanding of yeah. obs- obsession about eggs and, and ornithological crime, was chasing down these people who collect eggs, live eggs, steal them in parks and ref- bird refuges and, you know, climb trees, yeah. <laughs> Scotland, and, and risk their lives to grab these eggs and then blow them out and take them and put them in these secret collections that they have because it's all highly illegal so yeah 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 so, yeah so can you talk a little bit about some of you saw some of these collections and did you I meet did. with did you meet any of the people because they have a whole different psychology obsession I going on i saw them i wasn't yeah. really yeah it takes a lot of effort um yeah it wasn't totally i think i i was able to get enough about that world just by talking to andy and other wildlife people um, but I certainly had a lot of, t- you know, case studies in front of me and, uh, and um, uh, diaries and, you know, r- notes that they made. So it did give me some insight into the psychology of these people. Yeah, definitely yeah. obsessed. Yeah, they um, are. They're not really doing it for money or even show I, like like some of these are cases of eggs and drawers of eggs just in a storage unit that they go look at every now and then, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Up to like four or 5,000 eggs, yeah. Wow, wow. Yeah. They're, they're just doing it because they just enjoy it. I mean, they get a thrill going out there. And they get a thrill. 
breaking the law, you know, they aesthetically find the eggs incredible. It's because it's sort of like this. Also, this has this uh, the adventure element of finding these things. They go off in a wild goose chase. I mean, literally, you know, literally, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but some of these birds that are super pro eggs that are super prized are really, really hard to find. Yeah. Um, either because of their size or the way they're concealed in brush and stuff. And so that becomes a major uh, source of appeal. And there's also, of course, competition between these guys. There's a lot of things that, in their own weird pathology of set, you know, collecting f fetish, yeah. hoarding, whatever. So it all combines, I guess, in these personalities. And they're yeah. willing to do anything. I mean, they're willing to risk prison repeatedly. And some of them have been to jail ten, as many as 10 times. You know? Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. It just, it was a, yeah, an eye opener for me on, on some of the psych, psyche of these people and the, how they're, what yeah, the book took me down some interesting alleys like that, you know? Yeah. yeah. Did, did you have a lot of cringe factors as you were researching? I don't know. No, I wasn't many. cringing. I was, it was more like, I mean, Whoa, just, yeah, yeah amazing. <laughs> Yeah, how long did it take you to research for this story? You, you put a lot of time in. Yeah, it, about so you... two, a year and a half. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, that's a lot yeah. of lot of time. And you were able to travel to these different places, right? That Landrum. You... A few of them, absolutely. Oh. Okay. I went to Wales. Okay. I went to Southern Africa. I went to Zimbabwe, where Landrum was born. Okay. Uh, visited the national park near Bulawayo in the southern in southern Zimbabwe, where he kind of got his start in life, where his life life of crime began. Is and that then, is that where the black eagles were? Yeah, the yeah. African black eagle haunted the African black eagle. Okay. And then I went to Johannesburg um, to meet his brother, and was and then hopefully to meet Jeff, and then I met Jeff in near Pretoria. Um, and then where else have I been? I mean, I went to Southern, I went to, to I wanted to really, uh, well, I went to the Middle East. I went to Dubai and Abu Dhabi to look into the yeah. whole Falcon, receiving end of the Falcon uh, trade. And then I went to um, Patagonia and Brazil to kind of fill in the unknown, this unknown chapter of Lendrum's life in South America. Yeah. This hor horrible trouble he got into there. Yeah, yeah, that was, yeah, yeah, we can and talk. Nobody had, nobody had written a word about that, so that was you know, pretty interesting stuff to go and do. It was a crazy, yeah, as you know, I guess. Yeah. A crazy chapter in his life that made for a crazy chapter in the book. Oh, yeah, yeah. And just how he was found out in Patagonia as a whole right. <laughs> a whole story in itself, like a, a yeah. inquisitive uh, clerk at a hotel. And yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't want to give too much away unless you want to share right. stories. But yeah, it is a yeah, good story. I won't tell that one. <laughs> So what was so you were able to? Did you experience some of these falcon races in Dubai? And in yeah, I went little... to the falcon races. Okay. Uh, actually, in Abu Dhabi, I went oh. to a training ground, the, the Crown Prince's training ground. Okay, I'll flash in, some uh, pictures in up. Dubai, and then I went to Al Maktoum, and then I went to um, the the uh, president President's Cup, President Cup. I can't remember President Cup in Abu Dhabi. Oh, okay, um, which is one of these really rich. Uh, contests, three one week long wow. uh, contests. Yeah, I'm flashing a picture of um, somebody holding up a trophy. Um, yeah, yeah, is that yeah. the winner's circle? Yes, yeah, that's Abu Dhabi. yeah, yeah, that's amazing. So, um, how was it? How did you feel watching? Kind of Frankly, it was kind of dull. <laughs> really? really? It was a kind of an interesting milieu to see all these, you know, shakes and yeah. showing off their falcons to each other and the birds. Wait. But the sport itself, first of all, the birds, like they don't all race. Obviously, they don't. It's not like a horse race where 10 birds are flying out of the gate. I mean, because they're in the air it would be like, you know, chaos and <laughs> crashing and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So they have to race them sequentially, one after the other, 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 timing each one. This goes on all day. Wow. You know, at the beginning, you're kind of intrigued, but by the, you know, by the end. 90th heat of the day, it's sort of, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and they they by three days, and yeah. Wow, yeah, I didn't realize, and they they. But I was working the crowd, and you know, trying to. Um, I was there with an with an English breeder, a okay. very interesting guy, um, who was like the breeder to the shakes. 
mm-hmm. and um, to the to the royal families actually, and first for the first for uh, Dubai, and then then like then Abu Dhabi, which is like then the shakes of Abu Dhabi, which is like going from the Red Sox to the Yankees. Yeah. Um, I mean, they're just a bitter rivalry, and he's yeah. he's uh, you know. Um, Whoops! Whoops! You know, did I just hit something? Oh, fine. nope. You're still um, there. What was I gonna say? So yeah, so it was it was well worth, even though it was dull. It was uh, it was well worth going because you just hear the dialogue between you overhearing people and you're just getting the milieu and the what people and you're finding out about um, you know the crazy prices that these royal family members pay for pay for uh, the Falcons and then you're trying to catch a little bit you know what you can learn about the Falcon underworld and how much people actually know about it and how many of these birds may actually be from the wild you know these are these are the questions that I of course was not able to <laughs> ascertain but yeah um, probably not good to ask about it. yeah 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 and I think you talked a little bit about the the vet in the book as well correct um about or, what about the the breeder not the vet the breeder, oh, the breeder. a little bit yeah a very brief mention. Yeah, right? yeah. In close. Yeah. I thought I, thought I remember that. So um, they seem to take good care of their birds in captivity. They try to breed in captivity, but it's my understanding. Do they do they get these birds from the wild, like from Lendrum? And uh, no, um, no. I mean, there's a huge. Bryn is a major authorized government. I mean, breeder with these big contracts. Yeah. From royal families. He produces, um, you know, hundreds of falcons a year. In his breeding facility up in uh, uh, northern England, wow! And then uh, ships them to in in several several cargo holds um, wow. to 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 Abu Dhabi every uh, when would it when would it be when after they fledged and after they've had time to um, get trained in these what they call these hack pens, you know, mm-hmm. uh, where they develop the wing strength, and then there's like a moment where they have to where he has to um, bring them all in from the hack pen and, and, and basically um, capture them and then uh, get them ready for shipment. You know? So that's a process. So it's a real industry. Wow. Multi-million yeah. dollar business. Yeah. But so there, what, is that, there is an illegal element to it. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, what, what was Lundrum's role in this? Um, well, yeah. so um, that's, that's a good question. Mm-hmm. Um, so the Lent, there's this legitimate industry, the breed, the captive breeding industry, which is very well regulated. No birds are allowed to come from the wild. You have to show proof of their provenance that they were bred in captivity, etc. Uh, and then, but there's still this belief among many, many of the, the sheikhs in the Middle East that these captive birds, um, they they are not. Well, there are a couple of different uh, ideas going on here. One is that. Um, uh, the wild birds are genetically superior because they they're from the wild and uh, they have been through natural selection yeah. uh, become stronger survivors, right? As opposed to these coddled birds in the yeah. in the pens. And then the other idea is that after a while, you've had like the same kind of breeding stock for a while. you want to you want to uh, bring in fresh, you know, you want to uh, amp- amplify or or, pro- or provide some genetic variation. Uh, so you bring in outside birds to do that, and birds from the wild are preferable for that. So those are illegal. You can't trade those. You can't mm-hmm. take them as or trade them. Um, so that's where lend. But you can, if you have a lot of money, you can find these um, criminals who are willing to break environment, uh, uh, wildlife laws, and steal these birds and smuggle them to the yeah. Middle East. So that's that's what the business is all about. That's crazy. Yeah, and it didn't seem to me like what you wrote about Lendrum's life that he actually made a lot of money from this for him, I think. It's hard to say. You would think that he would given all the prices that you hear about these uh, for these birds. So I don't know. That's yeah, just like one of the mysteries that I can't, I can't figure out. I mean, he didn't really lead a particularly lavish lifestyle. He probably just didn't care about He was more interested. That's my theory. Mm-hmm. That is, he was interested in the attracted to it because of the adventure. Uh, the same thing that attracts these egg collectors, you know, yeah. and the challenge of smuggling them and breaking the rules. He was always a rule breaker, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, and um, and he's like a permanent permanent adolescent in a lot of ways. And yeah, you know, he wasn't going to have a nine to five job. So it probably his brother said it kind of made him, you know, enough money to sort of, you know, to to, to live an adequate life. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. Not have to- Hard, take these crazy trips to beautiful places. He loved birds. 
Um, so I guess he just did it partly for the love of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that that brings another interesting point. Like, I got the impression that he did love birds. And do you think that he really felt like he was doing this for the good of the environment? Or I mean, is that, I is that his because lie? I've talked maybe? to people who know him, who, who yeah. knew him, like the, a guy who gave him a, a home for uh, a couple of months after he was paroled from prison, um, who said that, you know, when Lendrum, uh, you know, he has, he makes these pious statements to the public and to the police about wanting to save these birds um, by bringing them to wealthy shakes where they'll be protected and called. And then he told this guy as they were lounging around a hot tub that, you know, yeah, if only I'd gotten through, I could have made, you know, 125,000 on this run, you know? So, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. Wow. I think he, I, he's a contradictory figure, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think, um, yeah, he seemed like a very good liar. Is that a good way a to say A very good liar. <laughs> yeah. if, you, if you met him without. A just, yeah. just an absolute blatant liar. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, he yeah. probably doesn't even know he's really doing it or, you know. Probably or just... not. So, Maybe he does, but it's something to watch him watch, sit across from him and know he's lying and just, you know, yeah, yeah just know it because you already have checked that story out. Yeah. So he actually wasn't that good a liar <laughs> because it wasn't too hard to figure out that the stories were lies. And he, you know, yeah. But I think he just kind of got by on, his, on a certain amount of charm and thinking that the people that he was lying to really didn't have the time or the effort to look into his stories and figure out if they were true yeah yeah, yeah until he met mick williams and and you yeah, yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i was gonna ask you know it seems like he would he seemed like a charmer um like if you knew what if you didn't know what he was doing i know that's hard to say you know if you didn't know what he's done in the past and you just met him you know he would he be a pretty likable guy and pretty I think convincing? if you're into that kind of personality yeah. it's yeah. kind of you know Af white South, white southern african guys kind of arrogant yeah. and, or i don't yeah, mean to stereotype of, but yeah great, you know not yeah. real book readers yeah. you know or intellects by any means but kind of you know really confident in the wild and yeah. and uh um you know extremely knowledgeable about an, about wild about the about wild animals mm -hmm. and um you know just able to kind of do things you know fix it fix an engine and you know, set up a crazy, you know, incredible logistic trip and fly a helicopter and, you know, if you yeah. like that kind of guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And speaking of helicopters, you can Google a video of him that's, it's still out there of him it's hanging, there. yeah, hanging yeah. from a helicopter, stealing yeah. eggs, jeer falcon eggs, I believe, up in the Arctic. And um, right. Right. yeah, it didn't seem like he was hiding what he was doing i just don't no, think don't the think world was aware that. yeah he wasn't he didn't he didn't expect that was going to be um uh, uploaded to youtube yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was only after he got caught yeah yeah and that's a story in itself too that um, yeah. is interesting to read about as well so um so people should be buying that book so we are taking questions from people i haven't received any yet i did hi charles says hi um but, you know, Lendrum was doing all this before, you know, before he was selling to the Middle East, you know, and as a child, how many, I mean, you probably don't know, but how many eggs do you think that he actually has taken from the wild? Do you, has there ever been no an way. estimate? Yeah. Never be known. Unless yeah. he tells, tells that story. Yeah. No. Well, I can tell you were the arrests and a couple of episodes I heard about through his um, you know, main accomplice who he uh, ended up having a falling out with who was, and then decided to screw him. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's, what we know, you know, I know Understood. about a couple of you know, great details about a couple of these episodes where he got away, Yeah. but all the other, but they had a, only a very short uh, egg thieving collaboration of just a couple of years. Right. After that, I mean, who knows? It's really only based on the, the, the arrests. Yeah. 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 Only well, real you can pinpoint just like five, four, four other expeditions. Yeah. Yeah. He started with his father at a young age too. Didn't his father teach him how to like blow out the egg? And um, his father started him in the egg collecting, in the egg yeah. collecting hobby. Yeah. And then um, they uh, sort of together uh, explored um, this big um, 
bird ref, bird refuge national park called Matobo National Park near their home. Um, and then they got involved in bird surveys with the Ornithological Society there. Yeah, that would amaze me. And yeah. then used that as a cover yeah. uh, to actually uh, find find all these nests and uh, go out and steal steal eggs from them. Yeah, under the uh, under the cover of being these ornithological researchers, and and basically naming in their records that the, you know the birds had fledged, but actually stealing the eggs long before the chicks were even hatched. Yeah. 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 And. You know, yeah, and that I was amazed at that. You know, they got involved in the survey and and learning. So they spent so much time learning about birds. And I mean, when he was smuggling them, he knew it was such a sensitive moment between you know for the incubation period whether he was going to be carrying eggs or live birds wrapped around his mm -hmm. belly at some point. <laughs> you know, it was crazy. Yeah, yeah. He really made you know he didn't judge it right a couple of times, but mostly he got it right. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. So. Well, Paige, Paige said um, she wanted to thank you for your writing. She just started your book. And thank she, you. She said yeah. that she did not know this was going on, so it opened her eyes. I'm sure many people's <laughs> that's, eyes. That's what I've heard on the good reads. <laughs> on the good reads. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In, input, so. yeah. Yeah, and I think, do you think Lendrum, you know, he got some... I don't, not to give too much away, stiffer sentences for his crimes later on. Yeah, kind not of. that stiff. I know, I know, but I mean, but, you know, these are nonviolent crimes. The yeah. British, the British legal system doesn't really want to lock people up for too long. Yeah. They're overtaxed, and prisons are crumbling, and they don't want to lock people up if they don't, you know, for nonviolent crimes if they can avoid it. Right. But you do have like a recidivist guy like Lender. You can't just give him a slap on the wrist, wrist, wrist each time. Yeah, and just yeah. let him go. I mean, I think right. that's why some of these egg collectors be in jail 10 times, get away with it. They're like, yeah, yeah I can spend a couple nights in jail and go. Do nah, it's more like six months. I oh, mean, okay. <laughs> egg collecting is six month prison sentence. Okay. But smuggling uh, wildlife in violation of CITES laws, you yeah. know, uh, that's a for, for profit. That's a bigger crime. Yeah. And that can get you seven years in Britain, in Great Britain. Yeah. Yeah. So did, yeah, was he kind of like the, the point, the turning point for some stiffer penalties maybe? I don't know. Yeah. He was late, just caught, you know, doing it for the fifth time or sixth time in yeah. 2018. I mean, it was clearly incorrigible. Um, you know, it was, it was lied on the witness stand. I mean, the usual. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm doing this for uh, the world. And given basically a two and a half year sentence and was out, you know, out in a year. So, wow. you know, I mean, judges, I mean, that kind of is sort of pushing the envelope for that kind of a crime. Yeah. But now the Brazilians want to get a hold of him. They, they, you know, they, they are, they're pursuing extradition uh, proceedings against him. And if they, they lost the first round, but now it's on appeal, they've appealed it. Yeah. He could end up back on, in a Brazilian, I mean, he could end up in a Brazilian prison. Yeah. If, but you know, there's, yeah. it, I, I, he probably won't, because his lawyers argued successfully the last time that the Brazilian prisons are cruel and unusual punishment, and British, we should not be sending people to serve to, to British to Brazilian jails, and they, the, the judges agree. Yeah. And so he's yeah. let out of jail in England on parole, but then they then they <clears throat> appealed the extradition uh, the, the decision. And then he was picked up again and is back in prison. I get, I think, awaiting, to, awaiting the, the 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 appeal result. Oh, yeah. okay. I was wondering if he was still, if he was back in prison or not. Have you been in contact with him at all, or? No, he's a, he not. He won't not, talk to you. He was last arrested in January twenty eighth, uh, okay. uh, July or June twenty eighteen. That's the last time I've talked to him. I okay. saw him on trial the next winter in London, uh, but we didn't speak. Oh, okay. Yeah. I should flash a picture of him. This is um, this is when you met him, I believe, in Pretoria. There's a picture yeah. of him looking at his cell phone, and this yeah. is that was in December 2017. Okay, so this is before the 2018, and yeah, he was having some health issues, I believe, he even was. at this time. Yeah, um, he'd had a car accident and he had prostate cancer, but yeah. he didn't seem like he was in bad shape. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so throughout this, it was interesting um, because I know I know you mentioned in the book that he contacted Mick Williams over time 
and it seemed like he was contacting you on occasion as well, right? Either yeah. by email, and I think he was into the fact that I, you know, that I was, I like, I wanted to go uh, retrace his steps down in South in South America. He really kind of, for some reason, like, kind of an appeal to him. Yeah, I mean, maybe he, he wasn't, thought you were going to never show. admit what he was doing. You know, he always had this presented himself as a scientist or yeah. whatever, and I went along with that. Yeah. So I wanted to just, you know, it sounds like a great place to go. I really like to, you know, go down there myself, and he would help me and give me the GPS points of the of the places that he went searching for the for these eggs, and so. I was able to go down to this vast wilderness and pretty much go to ex exactly. I was able to go to the exact places that he went. Um, obviously, I wasn't just going to go down to Patagonia unless I. So I was waiting and waiting for mm -hmm. a few months before he finally turned them over to me. And once I had them, then it was just uh, you know it was uh, yeah it was. Um, sorry, my phone my phone is ringing. <laughs> That's <phone>. okay. <laughs> is that going to bother up you? Sorry, guys. No. Nope. Distract. Let it go. <laughs> That's um, okay. Anyway, that's why I was like, yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah. Uh, so uh, I forgot where we were. That threw me off. What was that thing? Well, that's okay. Um, well, yeah, we were just talking about, you know, you were down, you were talking about retracing some of the steps in Patagonia and um, him contacting you over time. I oh, guess, yeah. Right. yeah. And then he gave, and then he gave me the, the nest sites finally. Yeah. It wasn't that he was resisting. I don't think he just, just kept forgetting whatever. Finally gave him to me, and then I went, and then I put together this trip to. Um, to Chile to mm -hmm. follow his footsteps there, which was, as I said, really fun. Yeah. Oh, that'd be a beautiful trip. I mean, these birds sure. are in beautiful locations. Very hard to get to. It's really amazing bird life down there. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you don't see anywhere else, you know, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, I was hoping to go there in January 2021. We'll see. <laughs> but um, my point of him contacting you and Andy, it seemed like, especially with. Oh, Andy, right. He. Yeah. um. It almost seemed like he was like reaching out, kind of that he, you know he would be talked down from something. Like I don't know, maybe I misinterpreted that part of the I book, but I don't, you don't think so? I don't think anybody could talk him down from anything. No. Yeah, because it seemed from, you mean from like a crime, a potential crime? Yeah, like like or when he wasn't active, maybe he was contacting you, but then as soon as he became active, it seemed like he shut off yeah, well, contact as with soon you. As guys. He got arrested. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. I don't know. Yeah, when I was reading it, I, I guess that's know. how I, was, I interpreted it. Lots of yeah. questions about his psychology that I, I was never. You know, <laughs> he just obviously wasn't coming totally clean with me, yeah. so I had to work around the edges. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know what motivated him to get continue to be in touch with Andy. Andy yeah. doesn't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just so lonely, lonely. I mean, there was just this kind of maybe he appreciated McWilliams' knowledge of respected his knowledge of birds there was some kind of bond there you know yeah Obviously, that's what it seemed a policeman you know yeah. even though this was the guy who put him away mm -hmm. yeah 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 i mean they made a good antagonist protagonist uh, mm -hmm. in the story for sure and do you keep in touch with uh mick williams at all is he I still do. i do i'm pretty regular in touch with him oh, okay yeah. Is he yeah. still working with uh, Wildlife Crime Unit? Yes, he okay. still there. I think he's nearing retirement, but he's still working, yeah. Yeah, your book just made me really hopeful um, to have people like him uh, involved. Well, that's good. That's what it's supposed yeah. to do. Yeah. 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 You know, because I really appreciated him and the people working with him and, you know, fighting these crimes. Because you hear of so many illegal pet trade things and you wonder... Mm -hmm. You know, are people really taking this seriously? And it was nice. Well, yeah, I think, yeah. you know, he's still fighting to a certain extent. Yeah. With this, this part of his career for respect, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And maybe he, that's why he was so happy to talk to me. He gave me all the time I wanted, you know? Oh, that's yeah. great. Yeah. yeah. And he, he, before you talked to him, I think he uh, he was part of the documentary Poached, or were you? Oh, okay. well, yeah, he was in that. That's a, a wonderful movie. Yep. And um, and he has kind of the starring policeman role in that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I haven't actually. It's on my queue to watch that, but um, yeah. Oh, it's a great, funny, yeah. disturbing movie. Yeah, <laughs> it looks <laughs> it looks kind of disturbing. Yeah, his what he went through, like finding some of these people, even like with the oh, badgers. Well, the director, the director. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's kind of disturbing, and it give me nightmares as an, you know. Me, the guy, but, the guy, one of the with the guy Fox mask, yeah. on camera. <laughs> There's just 
some very strange touches there. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and then they're just like, yeah, I, I knew I was doing wrong, but I'm going to do it right. again, you know. Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And they're like living in their parents' living room. Right. <laughs> in the house. Right. Not to speak poorly, but yeah. <laughs> so, so anyways, yeah, I mean, is there, there's so much I, I could talk about, but I, you know, your, your book opened up, you know, as you've heard this before, so much for me of a world that I didn't know. And Mm -hmm. it it is disturbing, but I think it's something that uh, part of the illegal trade that we need to know about so we can make changes for sure. Um, It's just crazy what people go to, what extent they go to, to entertain themselves these days. So, Yeah. yeah. I mean, after research, you know, researching this for the interview and just kind of seeing if it was still going on, I just saw an article in the New York Times that songbirds are being stuffed in curlers and rollers. I think I mentioned that in my story. That's been going on for, for oh I, yeah, I mean, in my book, in my book, that's been going on for a decade at least. Yeah, from, yeah, it's some guy is just from from Guyana. Guyana, yeah, exactly. Uh, it's just crazy that you know, and somebody just got arrested for that, like recently, like. Was it? In New York oh, there's City. my next book. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I'm sure there's a lot of illegal wildlife trade stuff you could continue yeah. this theme on Done. for sure. <laughs> yeah. I don't necessarily want to get a reputation. I like variety. I don't want yeah. to get pigeon, yeah. pigeonhole as yeah. an illegal wildlife smuggling book writer. Yeah. <laughs> do you, speaking of, do you have something planned for the future? Not really. Okay. No. Actually, I am, in fact, uh, collaborating, uh, helping somebody write a book. Somebody, in fact, in this world, so I shouldn't oh. say, yeah, um, uh, that I, I'm avoiding all such repeats. No, there's definitely an overlap there, but I, it's it's his story, and it's uh, I can't really, it's in progress okay. early, so I can't really talk about it. But yeah, but um, I'm working with him on that, but that's been sort of a perfect COVID-19 era project because I can operate work out of home. We just speak from Bangkok to Berlin, and um, and then um, and then um, you, you know. Uh, looking around, but not really. Uh, I haven't been able to go out, so yeah. <laughs> it's it's not that easy to generate ideas when you can't go. When you're at least in, for me, when yeah. you can't, when you're stuck at home for months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doing a lot of uh, online reading of uh, news newspaper articles kind and of. such. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, after writing this book, um, what? What do you think changed? Did anything change your life about this book? Did anything change in how you perceive? Changed my life in any way. Yeah. Um, well, I think it definitely made me more more interested in birds. No mm-hmm. question. I mean, definitely. Still, still, I really am. You know, when I'm out in places like we go to them, whenever every summer we until this summer we've been going to Martha's Vineyard for you know for a month and uh, and definitely since book research began, it's a great place for birds. Is and, it, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's great wetlands there, and you know, then you get the seabirds, and you know, then you get American, you know, the, the, the perching birds, all sorts of great bird life there. Yeah. Hawks. Um, uh, so yeah, I've, I've spent, uh, I've definitely um, devoted more time when I'm there to to looking, and uh, um, I don't know what else. Uh, I spent an awful lot of time in the UK, and I kind of just really feel like almost like the UK is my second yeah it just gave me more of an affection for the uk than i had even before i always love it but this was i really got to see you know deep dive into into yeah into just yeah yeah i mean provincial uk whale places like wales and liverpool and Mm -hmm. and uh you know that i didn't really know sort of london centric so that was fun i like i like the uk a lot and what else yeah there's a lot of birds there but yeah and you know, I just maybe they are like incredibly passionate about their birds. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. When I think of birding, I think of uh, yeah. so British, it got me yeah. deeply into that world, which is cool. Yeah, that yeah. is good. Um, I just got a comment from Bernadette. Is that okay to interrupt? Um, she said, um, "I feel like there is some kind of personality disorder that can be applied to Lendrum. Uh, zero humility, no acknowledgement of wrongdoing, narcissism comes to mind. Do you have any other thoughts on that? I know you touched on it. I don't like that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that seems to characterize him pretty well. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good. Yeah. So thank you for that, Bernadette. So and he does have some knowledge, you know, some knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. Some I mean, 
if he could have applied some of his brain to the, some of this experience to science, like he says he was doing, yeah. to actual, yeah. you know, it, it, it would be... A, he was physically brave yeah. and, uh, yeah, and knowledgeable about bird life and yeah. to some extent conservation-minded, uh, while at the same time stealing birds off and out of nests. I know it's a contradiction, but you sort of read about, if you read about him, you'll understand that, I think, yeah. Yeah, definitely. So what is the other, is, do you have another main message you want people to walk away from with this book as, as they're reading it? And um, I don't know. I think just, I, I think basically I intended it as a, as a entertaining, uh, you, you know, a, a, a yarn that also would, um, uh, you know, salute these wildlife police. Yeah. Pay some attention to them and just pay uh, uh, you know, respect to the um, multiplicity, you know, just the bounty of nature, you know, yeah. um, I want people, I, I, I really hope that that kind of naturalist sensibility infuses the book to some extent. It's not just a crime story. Right, know? right. Yeah. yeah, that's good. Yeah, I really appreciated, yeah, the whole wildlife crime unit um, and mm -hmm. the research that you did with that and Andy McWilliam. I was really, really hopeful for sure. So it's good. Yeah, yeah. So um, I don't have any other questions unless there's other stories you want to share from your book. Um, I don't think I think I don't want to give away too much. Yeah, so that's what I was afraid of. You might be intrigued enough at this point to yeah. go out and buy it. So yeah. yeah, yeah. I hope so. And and when I post uh, show notes, I can post a link. Um, they can get this book anywhere, right? On Amazon or do, anywhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Independent stores are open again in the states. I take it. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, yeah you can. Yeah, you can order. I don't know. When curbside. I left in February, they were the book was front and center on the on many independent bookstore tables. But who knows now? Yeah. You may, just, yeah. you may have to search for it. Yeah. When I bought mine at Point Reyes, it was front and center on just when you walked in the door, and it is. It's a beautiful cover. When was that? When was that? It was uh, February 14th. I bought yeah, that. Yeah. February 14th, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and then soon you after that. I... May 14th. That would have really made my. <laughs> yeah, so I, I did order your other book, um, and they did have The Falcon Thief at our local bookstore here. So uh -huh. I always try to local or order from local yeah. stores if I can. So. Cool. Um, yeah. But yeah, I look forward to seeing more of your work. And Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So do you have any other things you want to leave us with? Or no, I, no, I just, uh, yeah. Nobody's got any questions out there for us? No. Yeah. Should we? Yeah. We'll no. put it out there again. Are there any other questions for, for people? I think it might be kind of early here on the California coast. Yeah. So I don't know how many people are listening. Um, it varies. Pardon? Is this air again, or is this is it a one a one timer? It will be a recording, and so what I've noticed that a lot of times after I post, I'll get questions afterwards. So, um, you know, if I get any comments, I'll send them your way, or maybe yeah. um, if you go to the be provided page, you can see some of the comments. If you want okay. to answer, go for it. Okay, I might do that. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, so I can send you the link again too. But yeah, and I also make will make this an audio form for the podcast nice. that will go out That's to nice. iTunes and other places. It'll Excellent. just be audio. Okay. So okay. and and I'll have show notes with all the pictures you sent me. And uh -huh. um, yeah, thank you for those. And thank you. You're well. You're quite welcome. Always uh, like to you know juxtapose the images with the talk when I can. It's what I do on the book tour. So yeah, yeah. Well, I, yeah. I wish you the best of luck. And Thank you for I, having me. Thanks a lot for being interested in this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I hope it's... I feel like the momentum is still, it's still hanging in. I uh, hope as so. As we talked about before the show. So, Well, everybody, much. yeah, everybody I've talked to and shared it with are, you know, are either getting the book or they're, they've gotten well, it's, it. But, um, that's good. Yeah. yeah. Great. But, well, thank you, Joshua. I appreciate your time today. You and are so welcome, Marcia. Talk to you another time. Talk to you too. Sure. Yeah, good luck. Bye. Maybe maybe your next book. So, so thanks, Joshua. Have a good sure. day. Stay safe. <laughs>